right, test, test. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming here today. Uh, we're going to be talking about two things today at the Cassandra Meetup. So first, we have a coworker of mine, Saurabh, who's going to talk about batch loading data into Cassandra to help power our data products here at Coursera. After that, Christos from Netflix and I will talk about this evolution, which we are starting to see, which is building an API layer on top of Cassandra. And this has a variety of benefits. And it's kind of funny that the two of us have kind of simultaneously started on very similar projects. And so you get to see like how we both have approached the problem and whether there are any similarities and differences. So without any further ado, I'll introduce Saurabh, who will speak first. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we do batch loading into Cassandra for powering our data products. And I'm going to start with like how, like what was like, so to introduce myself, I'm Saurabh. I work on the analytics team at Coursera. And most of my interests lie in like machine learning and distributed systems. Um, so in this talk, I'll split this into three sections. Was talk about motivation for why did we want to build a batch loading system, and then talk mostly about the architecture of the system, and then end with how it helps us build data products faster. Um, so first, for the motivation part, it was if we wanted to build a data product, we would see that we did a lot of iterations as a data scientist on the model, and we will try to improve if it works better by measuring AUC, F score, or something like that. And then simultaneously, the product teams would iterate on the product cycle. But there was this dependency where the model would define like what sort of data does it want to use, or the product teams would have their own like requirements. And so the aim was that can we decouple data scientists to build MVP or prototypes much faster, and then have an API layer contract with the product teams that the data that is would be generated by this model is provided as some API, and the data scientists can iterate uh, independently. And so our main aim was we use Redshift as our main data warehouse. And then we didn't want to introduce a new data system, so we wanted to use Cassandra. So the main problem here is that we want to use data either that's already stored in Redshift or compute something and then batch load that into Cassandra. And we have around 10 or 12 data products style use cases now, but some of them are like, hey, features that are pre-computed for recommendations, features that exist for like search ranking or language localization per user, et cetera. And I think you're going to see how these apply as I go through the talk. Um, so the architecture is fairly simple. You have Redshift, and then you have like some other computed results either using EMR or some other computational system, and then you batch load that in using the loader into Cassandra. And then there's a Nostis service. Nostis is the name of our like batch loading framework. So there's a thin rest layer which sits on top of Cassandra, which all product teams would talk to. Um, so let's talk, go from like left to right, where we'll talk about the batch loading first. So in our internal job framework, we write every job as a YAML file. That's what these spe like specs for a job look like. So there is something called a step which says, hey, I want to load data which is generated using something that I've defined here. So in this example, you see that, hey, I'll give you a Redshift query that should give you some data. And can you load that into Nostis? Um, so it's integrated with our job framework, which is also an open source project by Coursera. And if you search on our GitHub account, you can find it. There's like documentation and previous talks on that. Um, and then let's say you've computed data. And now we use the SQL SS table writer, which is available as part of Cassandra to create SS tables out of whatever output was gen created by these generator files. And then this data is loaded into the Cassandra cluster using the SS table loader. The SS table loader automatically distributes data across all nodes based on like whatever is the replication strategy specified and things like that. Um, so now every run of the job is going to create a different table on the Cassandra cluster. So for a particular job, there'll be a version which is like, let's say, a runtime. And then it's going to create one table. 
And once the data loading is finished, the table is completely, completely immutable. So we are not allowing any writes. So the Nostis service is basically a read-only service and all writes should come from this batch loading framework. And then there's like a rest layer, which basically allows you to fetch particular keys for a particular job. So you're going to say, hey, for this job, for this index key, I want these fields. And the Scala client, uh, our backend is mostly written in Scala. So the Scala client allows you to specify, hey, I want these properties for a particular job and a key. And the properties are figured out using like reflection on the case class you want to serialize it as. Um, so to talk more, we keep three versions of the data on the cluster. Uh, so that in case we have a bad load, we can roll back to a previous version of the data because the tables are completely immutable. We can do like, we can directly just shift traffic to a previous version of the table. And then you don't need to do compactions on the table as such, because when you were creating the tables, you can guarantee that one key is only on one SS table. And that way you can like avoid compaction costs. And as, if once we are like happy with the new version of the data, we can just delete the oldest version of the table there. And there is an internal dashboard that powers like exploring data, doing rollbacks, which looks something like this. So for every job, we'll show what is the version that's being served right now. You're allowed to roll back. You can explore data for like a particular key, et cetera. And so now let's now that we have some understanding of how Nostis basically works, we can talk about like how it helps us build data products faster. So one example here would be user profiles. So we have this like inferred user profile job where we fe store features about a user that have that are like computationally expensive. So you can or like come from different data stores, etc. So you can say, hey, what languages is this user com comfortable in? This can come from what browser is this user using right now? Or what are the languages of the courses this user has enrolled in in the past? What languages does this user watch subtitles in? And we can aggregate all that and create like some, like we can infer what languages this user might be able to speak. So we, when we are creating recommendations, we only recommend them classes in these languages. And uh, only English speaker does not get classes in like say Hindi for that example. And then you can create like other computational results such as affinity to a particular domain, which is how likely is this user to enroll in data science classes versus say psychology classes. And then once we have these features, these are generally used to power like recommendations or different parts of the website or search or like any ranking system where we want to personalize these rankings by some user feature. So whatever is the product that can say, hey, I want like affinity for this user per domain so that I'm going to run this re-ranking step on top of that. Um, and we currently have like very similar other use cases, such as like you can create a profile per course where there are like inferred features about a course or, or other products that Coursera has. Um, that's so to end with, I can talk about some of the wins and problems we have. We have had the system in production about one and a half years now. And so the big win was Nostis really helped us iterate super fast. So like the data scientists could like build a comp offline model completely and then just ship results. And they didn't were like, they were completely independent of a product team. So they can like run A-B tests on their own, et cetera. And it was fairly easy to use SQL as a stable writer or as a stable broader. There's like a data stacks, the data stacks blog and documentation page has a very good article on this. You should definitely check that out. And then we use composite keys so that for a particular user, you don't want to fetch all fields. So we like figure out what fields do you want to fetch based on that. There's some downsides to this system. One is latency or staleness of the data this data is not updated in real time or so if you are powering a dashboard with some system like that, your dashboard is only updated when you run like a new version of the job. And the other thing is because we were dropping tables, you have to make sure that you clear snapshots across all nodes of the ring because just dropping the table does not actually clear snapshots from disk. Um, I can, yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. And I can take a few questions right now and then hand it to Daniel. Hi. Uh, two 
Yes. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yes. So I can answer both. So one, because our warehouse is Redshift. So let's say you were creating results using some EMR job. It was, there was no real way for us to fetch that data in like with low latency. Like right now, Cassandra provides us like three millisecond latency while Redshift has like a few seconds. So loading something like our homepage would be much, much slower if we went down that route. And then bulk loading because all these results were generated in a batch. So if, if we used like direct insert queries, it'll be much slower than directly loading this data. Uh, we tried both like Redshift was like never meant to serve real time traffic. So that was a no. And then doing direct inserts was much, much slower when we tried that out. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we ran some tests, but that was like a long while ago. But yes. I'll um, repeat the question yeah. so that people can hear it. Mm -hmm. the The question was. Did you actually quantify the performance gain from using the bulk loader versus doing an, an ups or? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, I can talk about that. So right now, in terms of performance, we can load like around 100 gigs of data, which is like, would say 20 million rows in about 10 minutes, which was much, much faster than actually running like 20 million insert queries. Uh, I think around like we did see five or six X improvement when we were trying the system. There have been like more improvements we have done to the loading framework beyond that point. And I've never run like that benchmarks like directly after that. But I can run it again and let you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Anything else? Uh let me hand it okay. Go ahead. Yeah. This is really quick. Um what tool or tools do your data scientists use? to query information once it's in Cassandra? Uh, so once it's in Cassandra, there's only the rest layer that lets you query the database. And there's no direct querying of the Cassandra cluster. And if the data scientists want to access the same feature, there's an already an offline copy in the warehouse. So it's basically only the product teams would query using like a service call. Yeah. Uh, I'll be around at the end to answer more questions. Let me hand it off to Daniel. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Hi, everyone. So we're going to switch gears a little. And I, Christos and I will talk about building a production API layer on top of Cassandra. So we'll start with Coursera's version, which is called Coral. Uh, and it's kind of after like correlating data around us. Um, so to begin with, I'm Daniel. I work on the infrastructure team here. And um, I wear many hats here, but one of them is involved with running Cassandra as well as building libraries and tooling on top of it. And the main aim really is to make sure that we have a scalable database that is easy to use for our developers. Uh, so as a quick uh, intro on what I'm going to talk about tonight, I'll give you a brief history of the approaches we've tried prior to launching this like API data layer. And then after that, I'll give you a, a look at how we have what we have in production today. I'll talk about the wins and problems we've encountered and also some future directions we are considering. So as a history, when we first launched Cassandra, it turns out there's a lot that goes into using Cassandra correctly, from like setting up the drivers correctly to using the right consistency levels to setting out retry policies, and I can go on and on. So what we did was we wrapped up all this into a very simple like key value abstraction library. And these libraries were built into the applications that our developers were building. Um, so that worked pretty well at the start until we had many, many applications. And then whenever we needed to update the library, say, for a critical bug fix, because I happened to write bugs like everybody else, uh, it meant that I had to redeploy all the applications or wait for people to redeploy all the applications, which turns out to be not a very good use of my time. Um, and then along the way, people were like, so key value is great for like most of my use cases, but I also want to index my data 
on a different key. How can I do this, right? Um, what ended up happening is I helped coach a few developers on how to write their own indexing strategy. But you know, after doing that like three, four times, it got a little bit problematic. So we wrote some more libraries to do that. And then those libraries had a few bugs. And then we had to do more bug fixes. And it got really messy. And so that got me thinking, like, we have service-oriented architecture for a reason. And that reason is you can encapsulate everything behind your service. And so you can update and push at your own timing. So with that, we decided to build Coral. And that exposes a document model to our developers, which is still a key value model where the key is the ID of your document, and the value is basically this like document that you persist. And we support declarative indexing, which means that you can say, hey, please also add an index on this particular property of my document. And I'll go through an example in a little bit to show you what this really means. Um, so as an example use case, which is one I recently helped launch, um, we need to store which users own a certain product, so they've bought it. And in particular, we store intervals. So for example, my user ID is one, I own like this course, and I own it from the period of 1st of January to 3rd of March, oh, sorry, 1st of March, and then later on from May <laughs> to August. Okay? And the queries we need to support for this are by user and product, which is exactly querying one document. But it also turns out it's useful to know for one user all the things they've owned. And so we need to kind of fetch multiple documents for every user product pair for that user. So in, in Coral, what you would do is you would define what we call a document collection, which is basically a set of documents that all follow the same schema. Uh, and in this definition file, we will specify which Cassandra cluster this is supposed to be stored on. And then after that, you give us what is the, the schema for your ID or key, and what is the schema for the value or data portion. And also after that, you can specify which indexes you want to declare on the document. Uh, and you can index both on things in the ID field and also in the document part. So for the schema language, we actually use a schema language called Courier, which is an open source project uh, on our GitHub. And I think the link is correct. So you can look at it when we publish our slides. Um, but basically what it is, it's an Avro-inspired data modeling language that's language agnostic. But more importantly, it encodes exactly what is a document we want to store. And so Coral will actually validate that users are pushing sane data, because sometimes our developers will update entries manually using Postman and stuff like that. Um, but more importantly, because we have insight into the schema of the data, it lets us then do indexing and stuff like that. Um, so the API is very simple. Uh, we expose get and set as you expect of a key value store. Uh, but more importantly, we also expose a list API on a document collection where you tell us which index you want us to use and what is the index value, and we'll pull out all the documents associated with that index. Uh, and we can do this largely because we have the schema of the document. So one of the core tenets of Coral is that it's supposed to be self-service. So ideally, we as the infrastructure team should not have to intervene whenever you launch a new document collection. In particular, once you land the new document collection definition, um, the service will automatically provision any new Cassandra tables that are necessary. Uh, and it will also warn you of potential errors that you might not have realized. For example, in this case, I'm showing an example warning where I've added a new field that will actually break any new consumers of the data because we added a new required field that doesn't have a default value. Um, so this gives a nice safety net because for persistent data, if you land backwards incompatible like data changes, you could potentially break other consumers of the same data, uh, especially since there's no such thing as an atomic deploy in our age. Um, and in line with self-service, if you notice, there's a nice like forced migrate button. It turns out developers like to change the schema any way they would like in test and in dev, and even sometimes before the product is fully rolled out. So we give them a way to override this warning and truncate their data or not truncate their data. Um, so wins. We use this schema system I talked about all throughout our stack. So from top to bottom, using the same schema language allows a lot of convenience for our developers because they do not need to worry about, oh, I have this like API model that has certain fields that I then need to redeclare in a different language or worry about serializing so that I can put it in the database. The same data you put in at the top 
could be stored in the bottom in the database layer if you wanted to. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, we do validation. So if you do something that's potentially dangerous, we will warn you about it. And here's an example of a Slack warning when you deploy something that may not exactly be safe. A second unexpected or somewhat expected win is because it's built on top of our standard service RPC stack, we get better monitoring and insight into who and what is using our Cassandra cluster and how. Uh, in particular, we have distributed system tracing on all our RPC calls. And it turns out this works too for our database layer, or rather our data access layer, Coral. So we can see down to the data access layer, you know, which calls were slow and which were not. And so when you're troubleshooting system performance, you can use the same monitoring tools you have for the rest of your services for your data layer too. Uh, and we actually instrument calls to Cassandra so we can see how long the actual Cassandra calls last. Um, of course, in Cassandra 3.0, there are ways to hook into like Cassandra tracing all the way down to the Cassandra nodes. But before that, we already have this from this system. So some problems that we are worried about, or at least keeps me awake at night, is I've kind of introduced a new like single point of failure. I mean, we definitely run more than one node, but it's still one single software binary. So technically, a bad push could bring around bar large parts of our site um, because if this becomes a true data access layer that's used by everybody, then if you have a bad deploy, you will just well, bring down everybody, right? Um, there's also some additional latency and CPU cost you pay because instead of shipping the data straight from Cassandra to your clients, you kind of have my service as the middleman that has to unserialize the data, do some validation, do any indexing you need, and then pass it along to the client and serialize it on the way out, right? And then the client has to deserialize it again. Um, so there's some additional latency and CPU introduced by that, but at our stage and, and um, of like scale and latency requirements, we find that the developer wins and the monitoring wins is much better and we will just pay this cost. Um, so some future work we're considering is one, one of the biggest pain points for our developer right now is a lot of them are worried that, you know, they'll forget certain index they need. And in fact, this is one of the largest pain points they find with Cassandra in general, in that you always need to start with your queries first. But of course, not everyone comes born into life with a crystal ball, so they don't always know what queries they need right away. Um, and so having this safety net of being able to backfill indexes will be a very big productivity boost for them. Uh, and because we have the schema, we will be able to do the index backfilling once we figure out how to scan over all the data and insert all the new like indexes we need. Um, we would also like to eventually have integrated caching so that for certain document collections where we know the request rate is very hot and very localized, we can just you know, flip a switch and get free caching. And then our developers do not each have to worry about how to do cache invalidation and all that kind of stuff. The last thing that we'll probably need to do at some later point is um, because this is a shared system, we are not deploying like a, a new Coral cluster for every single client we will need to put in some safeguards around multi-tenant usage, just so that one tenant who happens to have a bad deploy or does something crazy will not overwhelm the, our like shared cluster and use up all the resources, thereby starving all other consumers. Um, and there are other people who do similar work. So Twitter's shared like storage system does a lot of request rate limiting along these lines. And so I expect that in some point in the future, we'll probably need to at least invest a little bit in this. So with that, um, I think we'll actually wait for Crystals to finish presenting first, and then the two of us will take combined questions. All right, thank you. Excuse me while I plug in the most expensive browser I've ever owned. It's a pixel. Is it on screen? Awesome. And of course, I want to do a software update. No. So um, when, when Daniel told me um, what uh, he's going to be presenting, and I told him, well, are we just going to say the same thing twice? Uh, that doesn't make sense. And probably not interesting for the audience. Uh, but I decided to take another uh, another take on it, 
and 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 show it more from a higher level high higher level motivation um, of why uh, Netflix has decided to build a database API, and we call it DAPI internally, which is short for database API. Uh, my name is Christos Kalanzis. I lead cloud database engineering at Netflix, um, and I've spent the last four years at Netflix really. Uh, talking with and working with um, developers of um, the hundreds of microsystems that make up uh, the Netflix stack. And, uh, you know, we've, I've, I've, I've heard all the pains um, and, and my team has heard it as well. Um, you know, Cassandra's great, but, you know, I got to learn this thing. And, and um, we took it a step further um, we didn't think about just building an abstraction layer on top of Cassandra. We look at it as um, building a whole different data API, but I'm jumping ahead. Um, one complaint, uh, a quote actually, uh, even the best engineers can't keep it all in their heads. Uh, a very wise man said that. Um, <laughs> But um, like I said earlier, um, there's a lot of systems uh, at Netflix and a lot of technologies to support those systems. So one thing uh, I think about a lot and, and my peers at Netflix think about a lot is cognitive overload. Um, what do I mean by that? CD alone, we, uh, some of the systems we support and, and make available to um, our engineers is uh, Cassandra. Uh, Elasticsearch and Dynamite, uh, a distributed in memory data store that we created. But um, there's a lot more systems at Netflix. There's all this stuff. And, and if you're an engineer, how do, you, how do you keep that all straight in your head? These are all different APIs uh, and, and, and configurations that you need to learn, master to, to build an application. So this is where DAPI comes in. Um, DAP is meant to abstract multiple data stores into an easy to use feature rich database API. Uh, just like Daniel uh, mentioned, it, it's not um, a layer on, it's not just, hey, here's a REST interface, or actually it's a gRPC uh, interface for us uh, on top of, uh, of Cassandra. Here we actually support a different schema, uh, a, a more richer schema actually in, in some cases than Cassandra does. And if, if DAPI can at least take three of those systems and provide a unified API to use it, uh, that's already a win, um, a small win with, with, with all those systems you saw in the previous slide, but, uh, but, but a win for the engineers because it's one less thing they have to uh, learn. We're reducing the cognitive load on the, on the engineers. With, by reducing cognitive load and by, and by providing um, an API to, um, to use, uh, to consume those data stores, we're actually increasing development velocity for our engineers. Um, here, let me show you this. So uh, this, is, this is me who hasn't coded in years, <laughs> writing uh, pseudo pseudocode. Um, but I mean, if somebody wants, a lot of engineers, they use Elastic, they use Cassandra, and they use Dynamite uh, or any caching layer uh, together to achieve something in their application. Um, as we've spoken a lot, Cassandra's, uh, as you've probably heard, uh, until very recently, Cassandra was not very good with indexing uh, secondary keys. Um, so, you know, people would write to Cassandra, maybe they would use Elastic uh, to, to store information um, about, about what they just stored so that they can index different fields. Maybe they use reverse indexes, but it's, it's something extra they need to code. And maybe they want to cache, um, uh, cache the data or invalidate the cache. Uh, if, if they write something and when they read, well, anyone who's ever dealt with a caching layer, you, you go to the caching layer first on a miss or, 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 or sorry, you're first going to make a, 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 you're going to go to caching layer. Anyways, bottom line, it's, it's complex. It's a lot of code uh, and, and a lot of patterns you need to implement. Uh, if we can just offer them, hey, you write, here's the API and you read, 
there's the API and all the magic happens uh, um, in the background, that's another win. And, and, and development velocity, um, especially when you're trying to deploy multiple times per day hundreds of services, um, it's, it's very much appreciated by the engineers that we support. R&D and operations. Um, Daniel touched on this a little bit, but uh, I can summarize it with one picture. If an app goes through a service layer and, 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 and then it reads and writes to a database, you can do some really cool things behind that service layer. You can dual write uh, to uh, another database. Now you can, uh, you can experiment. Um, you know, this caching layer versus that caching layer, that, uh, uh, um, that uh, one store versus another store. Uh, you know, Elastic doesn't work, I'll do reverse indexes in, in, in Cassandra. You, you can really experiment and the, use, the end users don't have to change a line of code. We can control everything for them. From an operational point of view, it's actually the same, um, the same uh, picture as well. Uh, yes, Cassandra's great. You can do online upgrades. Um, when I joined uh, Netflix uh, four years ago, we were on 1.0. We quickly went to 1.1, 1.2. Uh, we went to 2.0, and we are on the tail end of our 2.1 upgrade right now. And all this without downtime without having to juggle master slaves, promoting a slave. I mean, you've all done that dance, right? Um, now, for Cassandra, it's, it's not that, um, it, it, it's probably not that useful, but what if um, you're using something like Elastic that doesn't have uh, online upgrade? Um, you know, you're gonna have to take downtime. And w when, you've, when you've set a precedent of my service never goes down um, in Netflix. Uh, that that expectation is is um, actually bleeds into the other data stores, and and you know if I tell an engineer, hey, you're using Elastic, sorry, buddy, but um, you're going to have to take downtime for me to upgrade it because uh, you're running a non-supported version anymore. Uh, they'll say, what? No, no, you figure it out. You just, you do it. You do it for Cassandra. You know, they don't appreciate you know um, all the power that's in Cassandra for us uh, to do that. But uh, yeah, not not all not all data stores or, or not all uh, quote unquote databases are are made the same. Um, so this gives us the power uh, not only from an operational point of so, uh, point of view to uh, perform upgrades. Uh, by dual writing, forklifting data, checking that everything's there, then you know, getting rid of the old stuff, uh, which which in a stateful world uh, is is something we weren't very uh, we weren't able to do um, easily in the past, but now with uh, with powerful ser service layers and powerful frameworks, we can. But it's not all rosy, um, you know. We've got concerns. Uh, Daniel already talked about performance. Interestingly enough, uh, some early uh, testing um, has shown a, a unexpected uh, surprise there. Um, yes, in theory, you're adding an extra hop. Uh, it, it, you know, it used to be network plus Cassandra overhead. Now it's network times two plus Cassandra overhead plus whatever you're doing in the service layer. But inter interestingly enough, when you've got uh, hundreds of clusters and probably uh, even more hundreds of apps connecting to those clusters, not everyone configures their, their client library optimally. Um, so uh, although they get uh, acceptable performance because you know we're not constantly being paged, uh, they're not getting the optimal performance they probably can. When you've got a service layer and and you control the schema and now and now you can um, you know what's going through it and what type of queries um, you can actually uh, superbly configure your client library to be as optimal as possible for those calls. So I, I don't have numbers with me. I, I, I didn't bring them. Uh, I hadn't cleared them uh, with not, not not with PR of the company, but with the developer. 
Um, but um, initial uh, initial uh, initial numbers show that uh, um, a test we did of DAPI straight to Cassandra actually performed better than CQ, DataStack CQL driver to Cassandra with default parameters. With you know what what we expect a Netflix engineer to just take it out of the box, use it, and not master what every knob does. Um, and so uh, that was an unexpected, um, an unexpected uh, outcome. But uh, obviously, um, that's not all engineers are the same. Some of them will see an increase in latency. And, and we're hoping the, um, uh, the, um, the net advantages out, um, outweigh any disadvantages. Cost. Um, I'm introducing a service layer. Those are machines that are going to be running that, that you know, we're, we're going to, you know, we run in AWS. Those are machines that are always going to be up. Um, what, uh, you know, there's no way, uh, there's no way that um, I'm going to be saving money here. I'm going to be costing Netflix more money. Um, one of the features we're building in uh, and we're building in this quarter is auto caching. Uh, right now, a, a lot of teams, uh, they're well served by their Cassandra cluster, but we've sized the Cassandra cluster to handle their throughput. Uh, Netflix has shown with the million writes per second, uh, and, and, and even a lot of data stacks uh, documentation has shown that Cassandra uh, grows linearly. Uh, throughput grows linearly as you add more nodes. Uh, but eventually, uh, you're adding nodes not because you need to store more data, but you need to support more throughput. And so let's say you sized a cluster to 100 nodes um, to, to handle a, a specific throughput. And they decided not to use a cache because they didn't want to, um, to handle the extra complexity uh, of using a cache. So how, how can DAPI help with cost? If we can automate the usage of cache and make it transparent, to the, uh, to the application developer, then in theory, and this is just you know, one use case, I can take a 100 node cluster, cut it in half, 50 nodes, add 20 node caching, and with, with three DAPI servers, I can serve all their traffic. That's an immediate cost win for adding this service layer. Um, complexity. Um, there's no way around that. Uh, we're, we're, we're adding another layer to the stack. Um, and um, we're, we're well, for us, we're introducing a new RPC um, protocol. We're using gRPC, so it's, so it's not going to be REST. Uh, Daniel, is, is yours REST, by the way? It's REST, yeah. So we're not going to be doing REST. We're going to be doing gRPC, uh, which is HTTP2, async. Um, it's, um, you know, um, binary protocol buffers, you know, all, all the new buzzwords, but it's all new to us as well. So uh, there's complexity there. Yes, it's hidden away from, um, from the end users, but, uh, you know, that's something my team's going to have to absorb and, 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 and really become really familiar with um, how, how, different, um, how, how different patterns affect, uh, affect the system. Uh, but yeah, and, and it's an extra layer that, that something can go wrong. Um, we, plan, we do more of a, so we've already solved the multi-tenant and we can do uh, roll, rolling deploys of, of new DAPI code. But, um, you know, if, if, if we mess something up, it's going to affect uh, more than one user because uh, it's still not a one-to-one -one relationship between the DAPI service and, uh, and, and the clients. So mine's not very long. I'm not going to show code other than that pseudo pseudo code. Uh, that's how Netflix is thinking about this service layer. Um, so I, I think this would be a great time for both of us to take questions. Yes. So we've heard from the two of you about your query proxy layers. And it, it seems like a very sensible way to, to access like many sorts of data stores. 
And I know from friends at Yelp that they have like a similar one. And I imagine that there are like one or one or two or five or ten more out there. Is there any hope for like a open source cross company data uh, data store layer that that one can just plug in? Uh, I'm sure there is, and <laughs> <laughs> I think it really depends on like what is your company's philosophy around how deeply integrated you want around like your your data storage layer to be with the rest of your company ecosystem. For example, if you are more like Google and you have one true way of doing everything, so protocol buffers and gRPC, yada, 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 then sure, you could open source it, but nobody else might use it because they might not do everything exactly the same way as you. Um, so there is a blessing and a curse because you could build something that's exactly tailored to how you do things at your company, but also turns out to be not exactly how anybody else wants to do anything. Uh, for example, for us, we chose to use Courier, which is based on a LinkedIn um, schema language uh, called Pegasus. But whether other people use that too, I really don't know, right? And whether they want to adopt that into their stack is an open question. So I, I would think that at least at some point there will be a common thing that eventually wins out as a winner. But if you truly believe in it and you build your like own, either by wrapping that open source thing or something, you probably will have better... Like at the end of the day, you want to go after developer productivity, right? So the more your stuff looks like everything else at the company, then the better the productivity of your developer will be. That's my answer. So I don't think there's a clear answer around maybe Crystal said something else. Um, you hit the nail on the head with the schema. Um, our, API in our, uh, our API is very familiar to the Dynamo, AWS DynamoDB API. Uh, that was a conscious decision, uh, not because we want to switch to that at, at any time in the future, but more because uh, it's it's a familiar thing. A lot of people use it, and it, and it, it, we thought adoption would uh, would benefit from from having an API that's that's uh, you know kind of popular. Um, the other part of it is. Uh, the one thing I fear about open sourcing something like this is um, we are, what we're building is very opinionated for the technologies that Netflix is using, uh, Cassandra, Elastic, Dynamite. I fear that uh, we would introduce uh, a lot more complexity because then if I want to be able to... Uh, to drop in any data store, that's yet another abstraction layer. I need to build on top of those uh, on top of those data stores. Yes, I'll eventually have to build it if I want to be able to swap data stores in and out. But uh, if if I started open, that'd be a lot more code and complexity I'm introducing right off the bat just to get off the ground. Uh, later on, we'll see. Uh, two of my engineers are back there, and you know we go back and forth a lot. Should we do this or not? Uh, but right now, the answer is no. But we are open to collaboration. If 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 our opinions um, uh, you know coincide with your opinions, in other words, the technology choices, this is something we probably wouldn't open, but open to be collaborating with with other companies and and both working on the same code base. Okay. Uh, the question is, how do we come up with the APIs? Why don't you answer first? Oh. <laughs> I sense the trend here. Um, <laughs> so the, the actual API itself is more around like what um, data storage model we've chosen. So we chose a document model. And like Crystal said, it's kind of like Dynamo's model, just because Dynamo cho probably chose it for a reason too, and it's familiar in it's simple so that we can implement it well, but it's not so simple that you know, it's useless to people. But as for the actual schema layer, then that what we do is we layer it on top of the primitive operations. So like set and get and list are all around documents of a certain type. And then there's a separate part of the code that validates the document and parses the document. And that's entirely up to the developers to decide like, you know, what they want in their schema. And we have a, a separate system around like making sure that the updates are compatible and stuff like that. That's good enough. Door, you've been waiting. Um, competition here, but I, I have the mic. Uh, 
as a, as a database developer, I can't say that I'm too fond of uh, these two layers, not, not to offend anyone. Uh, I think that there's more complexity to it. For instance, uh, if you wish always to write to Cassandra and Elastic, then uh, your, your function that you introduce will do it. But sometimes there's a value of uh, writing to uh, one out of two or two out of three, or sometimes you just wish to get a quick answer from Cassandra and maybe have the asynchronous interface to uh, Elastic because maybe it's just being upgraded now on God forbid, what's what going to happen over the upgrade to all of the Cassandra workload that will going to happen? Uh, or if you do schema migration, schema changes uh, live in production, then it's really, really complex already for the database layer. Now you add another layer that may not be there. In addition, um, I worked on the KVM project and the, the Zen project, and there was always the deliberate interface on, in the way. And uh, if you introduce a new feature for your database now, you need to wait till the uh, middle layer will going to implement it. Uh, and then there is a lot, of, all of these live projects are very active. So there is uh, Apache Zeppelin for tracing uh, that does really good job and you, and you get end-to-end -end tracing, including the client code. Now, maybe not that much. And, and lastly, one additional option to that you can implement this thing and may, maybe it's just suggested is another thing that doesn't you can combine that uh you you have your client side li library for that dapi or the, the first service uh one option is to um deploy it the way you did with the inter intermediate ser set of servers that will be along the way but another one would be maybe for part of the use cases is to just uh, have this library as a wraparound around the dr driver database driver implementation and directly go to the database without any intermediate. Th this way, it allows you like some sense of the best of all worlds. So, wow, there's a lot there. Um, l let me let me tackle it backwards because that's <laughs> that's how I remember it. Um, you're right. Um, the client, uh, so gRPC has a concept of interceptors, and you can build gRPC clients has a concept of interceptors. So it's not just a thin client uh, implementing the IDL that you plugged into uh, the application you built. Uh, you can do more with it. Uh, we already built uh, some interceptors to go straight to the caching layer. So at least in a, in a, in a read-heavy kind of system, it would go straight to the cache and not actually actually be even quicker because you're not doing the hop to the service layer and and and, and these are all things we're uh, we're uh, debating uh, i was going to say arguing but debating uh, internally of what what access pattern makes the most sense um, let's go one back again um, door remind me what, what was some of the other questions there Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is being used today. I'm not introducing a new concept to Netflix right now. There are apps using Elastic, using Cassandra, using it, um, using it in, in in interesting ways. And I, I'm not. I'm going to actually answer your other thing that the operational upgrades. And, and doing stuff in sync uh, is complex. It's complex today to begin with. So it's, it's, it's not going to get uh, any less complex uh, with DAPI. What it is going to give us is um, a little more control on, um, on, on the order of things and, and what's coming through and, and really understand what's coming through to the system. Uh, right now, to be honest, CDE has no clue what people are doing on the databases. We're t we're, our mandate is keep the lights up. So, you know, build a lot of automation around it and provide and vend, um, vend consulting to the teams of best practices. But we're not a gateway at, at, at Netflix by, by any means. We're not a gateway. That this is a schema, approved schema, go and do it. Kind of like DBAs traditionally used to do it in other companies. So. We keep the lights up. We 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 look for hotspots and then work with teams who have those hotspots. But that complexity of using all these things are there anyways. This actually takes us a step closer to 
understanding what's there. And, and you're right, there is Zipkin. You can do distributed uh, tracing and stuff like that. And, and quite frankly, tracing is, is a happy coincidence. It's a happy bonus. Actually, rate limiting is something we're looking at as, as possibly a, um, a feature we want to, um, uh, to implement in the service layer because then we can put high watermarks of RPS on certain databases and then drop things that pass over that watermark. For those who are uh, familiar with Histrix, uh, an open source library that we've got, it's kind of like circuit breakers and stuff like that. If, if, if we know that the app shouldn't be doing ever more than 15,000 RPS, then you know we can put a high watermark of say you know 25 but we've seen code pushes at the client side buggy code pushes push it to 50,000 so instead of bringing it bringing their own app down we're actually protecting them uh, on that end so it's it, it, you're right there's pro, there's definitely cons to it but uh, right now the way we're looking at it and we're taking small steps into this the pros are cur the, the the some net advantages are winning out on uh, on some of the cons, and it is it's 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 a complex system we're building, by no doubt. Um, I have a question, but I guess to to that point, we do something almost identical at Stormpath. We have Cassandra and Elasticsearch, and the the database viewpoint is nice, but like the reality is, Cassandra doesn't do full text search, right? It doesn't do mm -hmm. uh, schema list, you know, schemas that can be user entered for their own set of tuples. We have to support these features. We don't have a choice. We have to have a homogenization layer that allows us to do the things that you guys are doing, which I might want to talk with you about because I don't want to build this myself either. But um, <laughs> uh, and we are, and I don't want to do it anymore. But um, um, I guess the question I have is is more about implementation strategy for this. Do you guys tupleize your documents to have um, a set of key values for a single document? So let's say I have a document. It's got objects with nested objects with nested objects. We, for example, tupleize that into name value pairs with like kind of like a, a graph notation for each property in the document. And that allows us to put it in Elasticsearch. And so we can do complete searches based on where things are in the document. Do you kind of use Cassandra in a similar way where a row, a Cassandra row or partition is the document and each column value pair is a tuple in the document? Or do you guys how do you how do you approach that problem? I'm going to defer to Mikael, who's staring at his phone over there, and 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 maybe you guys can talk about that offline of 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 how we're doing that. Mikael is designing the API uh, for Dappy right now. Yeah, but do you want to? I um, just yeah. answer the question. So so very quick answer. So the way we do it is we just realize everything into a giant blob and put it in one value column. Um, it does mean that we can't actually do any projections. Um, I don't think that it's without precedent though. Like if you look at Google's data store API, which is like their DynamoDB equivalent, you can't actually do projections unless you have an index. So you have to specifically say, I want to support this sub projection, which probably means they push, pull it out into a separate like column, right? But in the blob approach, you can't do partial updates of individual. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. I mean, our API doesn't allow it either. We don't support patch. Um, so it is pretty limited. I don't think Dynamo can do patch either. Uh, and so far, it's been OK. I'm sure at some point, we will run into issues. But I think the thing to remember is we are just trying to solve the 80% use case. Right? And for us, that's not really a big problem right now. We, we had to do that already too, but yeah. again, yes. So this was for the Facebook side. You said that you decided to use your own custom if I got it right, your own custom rolled API layer instead of a RESTful interface. Yeah. Could, if you could speak about that a little bit more, the what informed that decision, why not to use REST? It seems like REST would be so much easier for consumers to get visibility of what was accessible. There must have been something driving it. Was it performance? Extremely good performance on ingestion, or if you could just address that. Sure. That, that's, so uh, from the Netflix side, why? Uh, why we didn't go rest. Right now, and Netflix is really looking at how, how can we do more with less? Um, and um, there's, there's a whole uh, team in Netflix called the Runtime Platform Team that thinks a lot about RPC. 
and and what is the best way of of processing uh, requests. And one thing we want to do is we want to introduce uh, async processing. And I know that DataStax drivers got async, but but if we're going to do more than what what DataStax uh, and Cassandra do, then then that layer needs to be uh, needs to support async. Uh, what we use is gRPC. Uh, gRPC is an open source uh, RPC uh, RPC and application framework from Google. And what you do is you define your IDL, you define your, your nouns and your verbs, your API, and, um, and, and you write your, your service layer uh, in, in, any, in, in multiple different languages. But what it gives you, and one, the other reason why we went with gRPC, is um, we're also struggling with polyglot at Netflix. Uh, we used to be a only Java shop. Now we're a mainly Java shop with Node.js and and a lot of Python in in the system level and people flirting with Go. Um, so um, if if we were to re-implement, yes, it is, isn't it? Um, and, and and what gRPC allows you to do is it, it's got an auto code generator, and it'll spit out a, a, a thin client in any one of 10 languages that it supports. Uh, and, and so the, the desire to go async, the desire to support polyglot is what led us to go down the gRPC route as opposed to, um, uh, to doing REST. Now, can you do async on REST? Yes. REST is the most polyglot thing of all. But I would I, I would love to get you in touch with uh, with Tim Bozart, uh, the leader of of that uh, of that runtime platform team, and he can go he can talk your ear off on 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 why he believes uh, gRPC is better than just p good old REST. Yeah, so G that's inside gRPC. So to the client, that's all free. To the client. No, no. So to the to the end. So when I mean client, sorry. What, to the application developer, they're getting a client. So all they're doing is coding to that client, and that client has your API there. Uh, it, it's an auto-generated uh, client that's created by uh, gRPC. So they don't have to mess with HTTP2, with async. That's all configuration at, their, at, at the client end. And that's another, that's a development velocity uh, play that uh, that team uh, identified as uh, an advantage of going uh, to gRPC as opposed to REST. But if you really are just basically that type of system, you're getting yeah. pre-built for you. Exactly. So you guys are building. Yes. Well, the code generator, if you build a gRPC application, the code generator gives it to you for free. All you add is any other interceptors you want that aren't necessarily part of the IDL. Cool. I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll stick around a little bit just to hang out. So I have one question. So uh, it's interesting that uh, these abstraction layers are actually kind of uh, supplementing the functionality that other technologies don't have, you know, like, you know, secondary indexes in Cassandra, but those are coming in Cassandra 3.0 on SASE. So doesn't it worry you that you're kind of implementing functionality that Cassandra doesn't have, and eventually it's gonna have, like what will happen to all this code, uh, rather than, you know, trying to build it for Cassandra and collaborating to the code base, you're kind of like, oh, it doesn't have it, I'm gonna build something else, but then that's completely not no use for Cassandra. Doesn't that bother you or worry um, you? I don't think necessarily like just because we have it, we won't use what Cassandra has or we won't contribute to what Cassandra has. I think what it actually lets us do is, oh, if materialized views in Cassandra works great for our use case, then we'll switch to it, right? Because then I don't have to maintain my code anymore. And because we are now the service owner, we can do the necessary code to transparently switch all our users over to the new secondary like materialized view in Cassandra and be done with it, right? Uh, whereas if it was a library pattern, I'd be like, I'm going to go to every team like, so Cassandra has materialized views. Do you want to switch? Like, can I help you switch? How about next week? How about next year or 10 years time, right? Like, because we are the service owner, 
it will be much easier for us to do it, right? We write some script, we look at all our fields that have secondary indexes, and then we write the bug, you know, all the, the usual good stuff, and we'll be done, right? Um, I think the aim here is we want to simplify the developer's point of view of stuff. That's the number one aim. And then the second is now we are in total control because below the API layer, we can do whatever we want, right? If materialized view is going to work great for us, then sure, we'll use it. If materialized view has some weird thing that doesn't quite work for us, we can either try and patch over that, that weirdness so that developers get the semantics they want, or we can choose not to use it, or we can work with Cassandra to get a patch in and then do some compare at the service layer. And then when it's ready, we can switch over. So I don't think having a, a API layer necessarily precludes us from using any core database layer. I think what it really means is our main aim is just to prevent our developers from having to think about all this, right? We don't want developers to be like, oh, look, I saw Cassandra 3.0 has materialized view. Should I use this, right? Or Cassandra 2.1 introduced or 2.0 introduced compare and set. Should I be using that instead, right? Um, we can do all the benchmarking. We can make sure whatever we release to people or expose to people will work well for them. No, because we're on two dot one. <laughs> so So there's one other dimension. So I agree with everything Daniel said. There's one other dimension. Um, I've got a couple more gray hairs than Daniel does, and some people in the audience have more gray hairs than I do. Um, Materialized views are very nascent in Cassandra right now. Sassy uh, is even more nascent uh, in, in Cassandra right now. Um, you're running 2.1? Yeah. yeah so 2.0, actually. 2.0. Oh, yeah. OK. Wow, we're ahead of you. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're finishing our 2.1 uh, implementation right now, and we're probably going to let that bake for a year. Uh, the cadence that we upgrade at we won't be to 3.5 or 3.7, 3.8, whichever one's adding those new features for at least a couple of years. And that's fine. We, we want, you know, there was a time when Netflix led the charge and, 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 and we were there, but now it's doing what we need to do. And, and, and we're, more than well, uh, we're more than happy to let smaller companies like Coursera, but you're behind us, so anyways. <laughs> uh, waiting for more nimble and, and, and companies that don't have a 40, 50 billion dollar valuation uh, to, to experiment with these things uh, before we get to it. Uh, so, um, but my users want it now. Um, and so it makes sense to build it uh, to build it. Now, whether I, I implement it via ES or I do the reverse indexing uh, myself as opposed to putting the burden on them, uh, my users don't care about the implementation. I care about the implementation. Um, and, and we'll choose the one that makes the most sense uh, from a complexity point of view and, and, and from a maintainability point of view. Uh, but there's another thing. There's, there's features that aren't coming in. Uh, uh, full text search, nowhere on the radar for Cassandra. And, and that's fine. It's, maybe it's not meant to ever have that. I can, I can implement something like full text search if I'm using a system on the side like ES. And, and yes, it's asynchronous. It, it, you know, I can't build a, a long distributed transaction across all of that and only come back when it's done. But if you set the expectations of your end users that, hey, you just wrote a whole bunch of records and, and that indexing you know, may, uh, may not be complete by the time uh, you know, it returns and now you, you go search for it, that's fine. As, it's all about setting the expectations and what the contract is uh, with, with, the, uh, with the end user. And when I mean end users, I mean the application developers at Netflix. As long as it's, it's, it, the expectations are set, they're okay with that as well. Yes. And what? I have one technical question. You mentioned that uh, you had a uh, better uh, performance than out-of-box driver. Uh, did you uh, achieve it only by proper tuning and configuration, or you did some low-level API? No, no, no. So um, the point I was trying to make is um, at, at Netflix, because we have hundreds of applications. Did everybody hear the question? 
No. So uh, he asked. The, uh, so I mentioned in my presentation that performance in theory, should be affected by a middle tier layer. However, we did a test where we showed it was actually better than going straight to Cassandra. And, and, and I mentioned because, you know, you just took the defaults. Um, at Netflix, because we have so many hundreds of applications, I, you know, it, it doesn't make sense from a scale point of view to tweak every application perfectly. So we bucket things. We bucket configurations into uh, write heavy, 50-50, read heavy. And, and, and we put apps around there. So there's no app which is perfectly configured at Netflix today. Sorry, it's just a reality. Um, but so what we took was, uh, this was a read test. So we took the read heavy, uh, no, actually we just took the default default configuration. The configuration I know a Netflix application developer would use if I told him, go download the Datastacks Java driver and use that to connect uh, to Cassandra. What, what would they do? They, they probably just put in the right port and right IP address and, and think they're, they're good to go, right? Um, and so it, given an app that is configured with pure defaults, um, it, what we found is uh, in a very limited test that it performed uh, not as well as going through the service API where we supremely twisted all the knobs to, to eke out all the performance we wanted from the back end. No low level APIs, straight, uh, straight. So it's a bit of a cheat, it's a bit of a cheat. Well, we, well we, we, when we, we, we brought the service up, we tweaked the parameters uh, to the exact load that we, uh, that we would have tweaked uh, the, the, the driver if the developer knew what they were doing. So it's a bit of a cheat, but it, it's actually re a realistic representation. Yeah. yeah. Akbar. Okay, so this, I guess this question's for both of you, both of you. Um, and this goes back to the API. Mm -hmm. And so looking at the API from the developer side, and then what it turns into on the back end, on the data side, um, is it like a, it, basically the short question is, is it a transliteration where it's sort of like a fixed API in the front, say key value or whatever, and you're transliterating it into CQL or, or calls to, to uh, Elastic, or is it much more of like a dynamic language on the front where you're parsing it into an AST and then, you know, basically doing code gen on the back end to, to uh, provide access to the breadth of the database features? Um. The client is pretty straightforward right now. It basically just takes what you give it and then passes it along to the server. And for the server, it does some validation. It extracts out the values you need to index. So we do need the schema so that we can parse the document correctly and then do the indexing, like fish out your index value properties and then put it in the database. But we don't do anything more special than that. Um, we do plan to code generate the clients in future just so that certain um, language features become more type safe. For example, like the, when you do a list, you say like, I want to list this particular property. So technically we can give you a type safe interface because we know what property you're trying to list over and what type that expects. But right now, because we support it for any client and we have a generic client, it just takes in like a type of object, right? So you don't any have any type safety there. So we can improve that part, but there isn't really any code generation involved for the actual like per document schema kind of stuff. And that's somewhat intentional because we don't want to have to do code generation on the fly to support like new use cases. So DAPI enforces a schema, uh, a, a data typed schema with columns. And, and we're, you know, uh, we haven't decided whether how, how severely we're gonna enforce it. Uh, or we're just going to drop stuff if, if you don't do something right. It'll probably evolve into a, a completely enforced schema when, when you write, uh, uh, maybe not when you read, maybe we'll have nullable columns, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's a data typed schema. So it's more of a mapping in the background. M map those fields to what a CQL query would look like if you inserted uh, that value. Does that make sense, Michael? Yeah, okay, good. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming.
this one. Right.